welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, why might letting go be the secret to better student behaviour? And I'm in conversation with Mark Goodwin. Thank you for having me, Pookie. Um, uh, my name's Mark Goodwin, um, equal parts education. Um, I'm a 20, over 20 year teacher and, and school leader. Uh, I was previously a deputy head um, the last three years, having set up a uh, education consultancy business, um, equal parts education. Uh, I work um, in two parts. Um, the first part is uh, one to one on a, a, an education coaching program for permanently excluded uh, students, uh, sometimes students that are out of school for other reason, but predominantly permanently excluded students and the other half of my work is um, in schools, teaching schools, universities, um, as a trainer and coach uh, working with uh, teachers and school leaders on behaviour. Wow, that you're busy. (laughs) Uh, The pandemic uh, is not good for um, uh, business uh, that relies that relies on ad hoc relationship with schools. Um, Some work stopped, some work hasn't. Sadly, Pookie, um, the pandemic is, um, as we both know, really hard on children and a lot of young people are really struggling. And um, the amount of students that are out of school or who are out of school and need support uh, means there's plenty of work to do. Um, But also teachers want help and advice and Uh, We're all struggling at the moment, but anybody that's got something that works with disengaged or disconnected students, um, uh, you're in demand. Um, So on the one hand, yeah, I lost uh, a bit of work, but on the other, uh, there's plenty of of places uh, to help. Absolutely. And the episode question today, so our jumping off point is, why might letting go be the secret to better student mm. behaviour? So we'll start there and we see where we go. Just what does that question even mean? <laughs> so that, that, that when we first uh, spoke about talking, um, I really wanted to, to frame the work I do in a way that um, I think would challenge me, but also challenge uh, listeners. You know, what, what is it? that gets the best out of young people who have become disconnected from school and their learning. And as we both know, they've become disconnected from themselves. So it was a a challenge to me and uh, a challenge to the listeners. Um, What is it that that, that you have to do in order to build those relationships and to get those uh, young people who are out of school um, uh, to reconnect with themselves? Um, and um, I was reading a couple of things, so a, a couple of books that had a quite a significant impact on me, um, and I was able to frame it, um, frame the work I did with this idea of letting go. Um, as a teacher, we build our reputations, we build our credibility, we build our professional credibility on um, uh uh, being in control, actually, <laughs> you know, on being um, in control um, of uh, no- knowing what we're doing, of um, uh, delivering results on performance, um, on um, our ego, <laughs> on on what we do personally, and so much of teaching does rest on that. Uh, but I realised that in in turning around these young people that have become disconnected, it was actually the opposite, and. Um, I've come to this, you know, why, why the question, get back to the question, Mark, um, because when you're working with kids that are permanently excluded, everything else has failed, really. Um, they, they have um, been ex- permanently excluded from education. And I, I do believe that um, overwhelmingly schools and education try everything to keep kids in there. And um, you know, I, I believe that because uh, I believe that's what education is, that one of the foundation, foundational principles of education. So something really catastrophic has happened when a kid is, um, has been permanently excluded. So um, for me, I've got to try something different. I've got to uh, let go of certain things. Uh, and I suppose what's interesting is what are the things that I've let go of? 
And um, uh, I'll start with probably the most challenging thing is um, I've had to let go of uh, of being right all the time. Um, I've had to let go of um, thinking I've got all the answers um, because um, working uh, with um, working with permanently excluded students, working uh, in alternative and special, as I have done now for three years, um, I've been tested professionally, but also I've learned an enormous amount professionally as a teacher. Um, and even 20 plus years, I've learned so much um, in these last three years. So, uh, and I would say the first thing that I've let go of is always been right. Um, being right, uh, uh, just gets you backed into a corner uh, and it backs the young person into a corner because you have to prove your point. So I've got very used to saying, well, I'm not sure. Um, I've got very used to saying, well, maybe I've got used to saying, well, you know, your opinion's valid, but there are other opinions. Um, what I am rock solid on um, is a commitment. So there's, there, there, there's probably a balance in all of these observations of mine. Um, there is a rock solid commitment to their better future, to their potential, to their goals and, and what they want to do. But as, as we get in there and as we work in there, um, I, I'm quite prepared to, um, to give them the floor. I'm quite prepared for them to, to hold an opinion that I might disagree with. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, being right is one of the first things that I, I would let go of. You said there about um, you're prepared to hold sort of different opinions than the young people that you might be working with. What if that opinion that differs is around their sort of, you know, their fundamental right to a better future, for example? I'm assuming you're working with some kids who've got some quite challenging stuff going on and that maybe you think that they can aspire to a certain way of being or doing for example and they might disagree well that's where yeah that that bit of the conversation is is where I show how much I believe in them and that's where they they know from the very outset that I am fully committed to a potential that they may not believe in um, so they can hold the opinion they're useless they can hold the opinion that they're a waste of space, that they are you know, pathetic and a failure. But I'll, I'll continually challenge that. Um, and um, that is um, uh, a really important part of the of the work that they see. And it, it's building trust, isn't it? Uh, it's that unconditional positive regard that um, they often have lacked. Um, and um, that means that. I suppose where I have to let them them be right is in their view of school and education. Um, I could point out how they've made a failure of it. I could point out how they've let themselves down and they've made mistakes. Um, but what, what does that achieve? It just pushes them deeper into the hole that they're in. And my job is to try and get them out of that and get them into a space where uh, learning uh, makes more sense to them, education makes more sense to them, and their future makes more sense to them. So tell us a little bit more about your your work and the bits about it that you really enjoy and what it is that you're trying to do and what 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 does success look like for you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, one of the things that you that, that I let go of is is, is results. Is, is you know the the, the typical teacher um, key performance indicator. You know results, um, and that's not to say that I don't get incredible results. Um, you know, kids back into college that were permanently excluded, kids GCSEs that were permanently excluded, kids back into school that were permanently excluded. But if you go on about those results all the time and how important it is. Um, it's, uh, it, 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 it crushes and, and confuses uh, kids. Um, now, I, I recognise, Pookie, that I've got a luxury that schools haven't uh, because success for me uh, is getting these kids back into school. Um, uh, ultimately, they will take exams and some do take exams, but I know the pressure that school is under, so, so I'm not being blasé uh, about that. But for me, it's less about the results. The results are important. I talk about gateways. I talk about opening up their future, but I'm more interested in the process. So rather than go on about the results, I go on about the process. Um, and the process is day to day, 
with with these young people sometimes only for an hour but often for two hours um it's about um uh, completing some meaningful work completing some learning so um a, a typical um some of my work's in schools uh, some of my, my my work looks like workshops uh, but often it will be a a, a teaching session uh, will be me um, going through, I'm a history tra trained uh, teacher, so sometimes it's history, sometimes it's math, sometimes it's English, uh, sometimes it's um, uh, uh, history, I have, I have taught that in these uh, circumstances, um, and it's challenging the, the young person uh, to, do the, um, to do the work, um, challenging them in a supportive way, uh, challenging them in a compassionate way. I'm a, I'm a trained coach and I, I use a lot of solutions focused coaching uh, strategies. You know, what is our goal uh, today? What, what, what is the, the aim of today? Um, and um, it's working through their resistance. It's working through their self-doubt. Um, it's rebuilding confidence in, in, in learning. Um, and I do that um, by um, uh, helping them, challenging them, but then helping them work through that challenge. Um, a lot of mistakes get made. So something that you can, that I have to let go of is, uh, is mistakes. Um, that a lot of mistakes are made. Um, but it's using that idea of first attempts in learning and reminding them that it's not um, uh, it's not a mistake, it's not final, uh, it's not the end if they're prepared to have another go. Um, I suppose it, encapsulating it all in, in one idea, it's about building resilience, uh, Puki, um, and um, with students that um, have been so wounded uh, by education, um, that is hard, but it, it can be done. And the success looks like uh, just today, I was um, on the last day of transition for a young person that is starting in year six, having been excluded last January. So me and another tutor uh, from Reflective Learning, um, uh, who I, I mainly work with, Reflective School Support, um, so uh, B has, uh, is going to start full time at, uh, at his new primary school in, um, on, on Monday. And that's after a year of, of working with us. And um, success looks like um, uh, Jay uh, from, from last year, who was permanently excluded in year 11. Uh, and I picked him up in April of year 11 and we got him some qualifications ones and twos but it was enough with a bit of help to, to get him onto a college course and he's on a college course um, and um, success can look um, uh, success can look like exam results it can also just um, look like a kid that feels better about themselves and re-engages with education so um, some of the students uh, I've worked with have been um, key stage two, have been younger, who have been permanently excluded, and they just get back into a school that they are better suited to. Um, so success um, is still, I'm still proud of, of the successes, um, but rather than um, use that um, as, as, a, as an indicator, I try and keep the young people focused on the day to day, on what we can do in the next hour, what we can do in the next uh, two hours, sometimes what we can do in the next five minutes to move them closer to that. Is that because it feels too big and scary to you or to them otherwise? Or is it what's the reason for that? that, that kind I have to I have to hold that um, that that I have to um, create. So sometimes I'm, I, I am scared. You know, I'm a I'm a human being. Um, uh, Pookie, and sometimes I'm scared, you know, I'm fearful um, for the young person and the situation they're in. I'm fearful of, for their future, but I, I know I'm, I'm very confident in what I've done and where I can get them to. So I have to um, hold a space for them that is um, supportive, that is uh, unconditionally positive, um, that is uh, a, a place that they're comfortable in. So I have to choose the work carefully. I have to choose my words carefully. I have to choose my conversations carefully. And that's, um, uh, that's where 
um, I suppose I have to let go of the, the, the natural fear and anxiety and apprehension that might accompany work with a challenging student. I mean, I'm a 20 plus year uh, teacher. You know, the last thing I want is to be told how useless I am or what a waste of space I am or um, how my lesson can go, you know, do one today. Um, but I have to uh, uh, let that go. I have to uh, ignore that and I have to secure and offer um, uh, a very uh, flexible learning space where they can start to re-engage and reconnect with learning. So basically, I mean, one thing that I always say to teachers, one thing that you can do for the, the kids that find school difficult in your class, the one thing that you can do is just when you've done your planning, when you've planned your lessons, just look at that work, just spend two minutes uh, looking at that work through the eye of the most disengaged student in your class, whether it's, you know, mainstream, primary, special, just look at it through the most, what does the literacy ex expectations have? What does the, 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 the written work, what, and, and ask yourself what you could do to make that engaging. So two minutes uh, of, yeah, I accept it's double planning, it's another job, but two minutes can save 30 minutes of heartache in the in, in the classroom just look at the work and I, I do that for every what does this look like to Jay what does this look like to B um, who um, uh, has decided that they hate uh, and will never do a, a written piece of work they hate maths so what does this work look like to them how can I make it uh, engaging how can I make it something that they might want to pick up and um, those those two minutes uh, can make all the difference for teachers. There's a very practical way uh, of looking at your planning to um, avoid possible challenge and uh, confrontation. And what works there? Because I love that idea and that's such a, a simple sounding piece of advice. Look at the work that you're setting through the eyes of the most disengaged learner. But what does that mean in practice? Does that mean you're having to do things that are exciting or like culturally relevant or well, I don't know I'm not a teacher you'll have to yeah yeah so yeah. I do um I, I my mentor my first mentor um said to me that you, you've got to make it engaging and you've got to make make, make your teaching fun and he's a great teacher he's one of those teachers um and he went on to be a head teacher I kept in touch with him for a long time but he said to me Mark you've got to make your make your lesson engaging and fun but you don't teach the history of skateboarding and it, it I, I completely understood what he said. You know, I, I don't I don't teach the history of Premier League football or the history of uh, Call of Duty, but you might use that as a hook to get them interested. Um, but no, Pookie, I mean, I teach um, uh, I, I'm a trained teacher in um, philosophy for children. So I do a lot of open ending phil philosophical inquiry. Um, I, I, for example, I play I play cards to to engage with maths and numbers. Um, reading. Um, all the kids I work with read a book. We, we, we find a book. Sometimes that's a bit of a struggle, but uh, I, I know books well enough to, to find a book that will land. And I'm talking about lads that haven't read for five, six, seven, eight years. The last book they read was in year four. They read Roald Dahl as a class, but I find books that, you know, it's through reading that, you know, the world and the imag imagination come alive. Um, so it looks like um, I'll often use some tricks and gimmicks to get them engaged, but then the learning is, you know, proper, you know, curriculum learning. Um, we did the, um, uh, I did something on the American election with somebody that hadn't got a clue that there was even an election in America uh, with one of the lads. Uh, we did the Holocaust Memorial Day today, um, you know, with uh, uh, with um, one of the kids um, uh, this morning. Um, so and yeah, and and P for C um, is a great um, uh, teaching approach. The, the the teaching of philosophical philosophical inquiry um, is has been shown to to have a a massive learning impact on uh, the most disengaged students. Um, big open-ended questions, their opinions are, are valued and noted, they get a chance to talk about it. It's conversational and not written, but once you get those conversations going, then you can steer them towards the learning that you want um, and steer them towards um, 
something uh, linked to a, a, a one of the topics. I mean, I'll be completely honest about this, Pookie. Uh, year 11 boys, year 11 boys, uh, which uh, we, uh, we pick up a lot of those um, as permanently excluded. Year 10, year 11, and they like motorbikes and you can teach anything through their love of a motorbike. I've done science, maths and English um, and they like boxing. Um, they like mixed martial arts. It's not my boxing is, but um, ultimate um, ultimate fighter and uh, mixed martial arts is not my thing. But I'll happily talk about that if it gets them to write a piece of descriptive writing or a flyer for a gym or whatever it is that's needed uh, to get the English through. So I'll, I'll absolutely use their interests um, to to get them connected to their learning. And what? Can you talk to me a little bit about what's happening for the children who kind of end up on your case load? I don't know how you describe it, but particularly, I'm particularly interested about the younger ones. I mean, it, it, it's conceivable that someone in year 10, year 11, that things might have got to a point where they need your kind of intervention. But the idea that you're working with children in primary school it's, it's a bit heartbreaking, actually. I mean, all of it is, but you know what I mean? And what, what's gone oh, wrong for them? Yeah. Um, so um, I'm really, uh, really diplomatic because, you know, I was, I was a deputy head um, in a mainstream secondary comprehensive. Uh, I've sat in those exclusion meetings um, explaining to parents. I know that schools make very, very difficult situations. So I, I'm not judging any school. But uh, it does beg the question with the school, what's gone wrong if you've permanently excluded a five-year-old, mm. <laughs> a seven-year-old? Really? You know, you've said that there are no more chances. There are no more opportunities. There is nothing else we can do for you. So uh, it does happen, Pookie. And sadly, the first, when I first started doing this work, the first two lads that I worked with were both permanently excluded at the start, at the end of year five. Wow. Um, now, why would a primary school do that with a difficult kid, with uh, SEN, you know, with, with, with special educational needs? You know, why would they do that? And uh, that's a rhetorical question, but I think all your listeners will know why they might do that uh, with the pressure of SATs in the next year and uh, concerns about results. But, you know, that's a, a question I'll leave there for, for other people uh, because um, it is um, desperately sad. Um, when when this happens, because it's telling a a, a, a seven year old, a, a ten year old, uh, that there's no more chances, um, that, that they've used up all their chances. Um, so the first thing uh, to do is to um, uh, actually start to to rebuild um, their uh, self belief uh, and their self confidence. Um, and uh, a part of that work is a. Uh, it is a, it is a, a strategy I use. I'm, I'm really passionate about. Actually, I call it the cookie jar. Um, I think it, I think it comes from um, CBT. I, 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 somebody said, "Oh, you know, that's a CBT." I didn't know it was that. I actually got it from an ultra runner named uh, David Goggins, um, and uh, he runs hundred mile races. Just an incredible athlete. But he talks about you know overcoming um his willingness to do it he talks about his resilience and he builds his resilience by holding a cookie jar full of all the times he's trained when he thought he couldn't of all the races he's completed of all the injuries that he's overcome and he kind of holds these in a mental cookie jar and i thought that is just a brilliant idea and what i actually do is i actually set up a, a cookie jar for the young person and it works with um, key stage two it works with the young ones it works with the older ones and what I do is is I tell them right at the outset that every time they do something that they didn't think that they could do every time they do something whether it's just you know writing a sentence or answering a question or taking their hood off you know it, we could we start very small but every time they do something they thought they couldn't do I put it in the cookie jar so in the cookie jar we end up with slips of paper, uh, whole of the eight times table. Okay, that's what I think it was. Uh, it was Jay uh, who managed that. So that went in there, and that young person has now got a visual uh, demonstration of of my 
believing in them, of my noticing them, of them doing good things. And it only takes three or four in there for me to be able to say, when they say they can't do something, when they say it's too hard, I just say, well, last week, what did we do last week? And you can point to the cookie jar. The idea being that it's something they can go back to. It's a sweet treat that they can get out of the cookie jar when they're finding things hard and when they're finding things difficult. And I've used a, a physical cookie jar like that. I've also used just a, a sheet of paper and we put post-it notes on it. Or we uh, use the back of their exercise book, the back of their workbook and write things down. But the the idea is that, um, and, and, and the, the reason it works is that I'm noticing them, that they are building their self-esteem, not because of motivational sayings or me saying how great they are. They're building their self-esteem by performing esteemable acts, by taking action that's building up their self-esteem. And I've, I've used this countless times, Pookie. I, I tell anybody that would listen about how important it is. Um, because um, it's building intrinsic motivation. And that's the clincher when we talk about motivated young people. Um, we can, um, you know, uh, we, we, we can motivate, we can reward, but what we really want is independent young people that are doing it for themselves. And that cookie jar is, is one of the main reasons, I believe, um, why, um, uh, I get the results that I do. And going back to the original question of the podcast, which is about letting go, and um, I'm letting go of judgment. Um, I'm letting go of the judgments the young people have previously received uh, about how many mistakes they make, how many failings they've um, uh, committed. And uh, I'm letting go of that. And I'm building up a, a new judgment of them, a new perception of them, uh, a new way of them being, which is uh, more independent and more intrinsically motivated. I, I, th I think it's brilliant having that um, tangible way of uh, representing it. So I often talk about creating I can cycles when working with children who are anxious um, and like you, just starting really, really small um, and building the idea of the things that the child can do. But I think having that actual kind of, you know, visible reminder is a really powerful um, way of doing it. I, I've got a big question for you, um, which I, I have an opinion, I'm sure everyone has an opinion on, but does everybody, does everybody deserve a second chance? I'm sure sometimes in your work, you will be working with children who everyone else has given up on um, and you're, you're there presumably trying to help them. Um, yeah, do any of them test you? <laughs> um, that's the... Um... Yeah, um, I worked with a um, uh, I worked with a young lady last year um, who, because of as you can imagine, Pookie, in incredibly sad trauma in her life, um, was uh, lashed out. You know, a, a good session was that she would um, not tell me to f1 you know not tell me that what a worthless <laughs> no good waste of space piece of teacher half-hearted nonsense in the most fruity language you could imagine and you know um but you know if you believe in this work and i do uh, if you believe in, and are committed to young people's futures then that girl more than perhaps more than any other student that i work with deserved a second chance and deserved me turning up there in the hope that little by little um, the wheels start to turn in a more positive direction and she was you know incredibly wounded um, and um, I worked with her for about six months uh, up until the first lockdown last March uh, and sadly um, the uh, a lot of the work that we pick up is contracts from uh, local authorities and uh, of course she went back into her um, education provision um, and uh, our work, uh, my work finished with her. But over the, the six months or so from the December to the March that I worked with her, I, I, it was starting to make a difference. Um, you know, less um, challenge, uh, less 
um, conflict, more work. Um, it was just, it was really hard to find what landed. And I talked to, you know, all this talk about double planning. I was triple planning. I, I had to have two or three things ready for the, the stuff she rejected. Uh, but we started to work, for example, she, she'd be happily copying. Um, so uh, I'd give her um, some text or some some questions and, and she'd be happy copying the questions and then writing her answers. Now, that to me was a complete waste of time. Why, why would you do that? You know, as a student, as you, why would you copy? But that, that's what she needed to copy out the question first, copy out the question in her own handwriting and then do the answer. So you, you, I learned so much from her, uh, bless her. Um, and yeah, I think it, it, I'm committed to this work, Pookie, and every kid deserves a second chance. Um, where else does, um, without getting too highfalutin about it, but where else does redemption lie? Where else does rehabilitation uh, lie? Where, where else does restorative justice lie if it doesn't lie, you know, uh, if you can't create a, the space for a second chance? And uh, I, I say to people, uh, as well these are young people you know they, these are not adults you know where they you know you you perhaps expect a bit more from from adults and you might be less willing if they do certain things but um i i say all of this with i've got um, a bit a bit of a, a mantra that i say and um anybody can make a mistake but only a fool repeats it and the kids will laugh and they'll they'll smile but i know that lands you know I, i'll give you a second chance but you know don't push it <laughs> you know, um, I, I'm, we're talking about things here. I don't want you to keep making this mistake. And m mistakes is the the, the the classic thing that you talk about when you talk about letting go. You know, look at how much judgment as a culture in the United Kingdom, as an education culture, look how, how loaded mistakes are and, and how fearful people are, kids are of making mistakes, adults are of making mistakes. And so I have to uh, generate a, a different relationship for the kid with mistakes. You know, I want them to make mistakes. I want them to get things wrong because that's how they're going to learn. But I also want them to acknowledge their mistakes. You know, they've, they've made mistakes. If you've been permanently excluded from school, you've made mistakes. And you can point the finger wherever you like, but you have made mistakes. And it's acknowledging those mistakes and forgiving themselves. They've got to forgive themselves and learn from those mistakes. Um, I talk about teachable moments. You know, kids curse under their breath or they uh, they get something wrong or they screw the paper up or they say something. Um, we talk about teachable moments. What, you know, what can we learn from that? So open up the conversation around mistakes. And for goodness sake, you know, let's have uh, a whole lot less shaming, naming and shaming and guilt around mistakes. Because it's not helpful to the young person if we want to move them forward. Um, and that's where I let go. I, I tell them about the mistakes that I've made. The speeding tickets that I've got, you know, I can blame the speed camera. You know, I can I can moan about the uh, the police and haven't they got better? But there's no, you know, I've made a mistake. I was speeding in the wrong area. Um, thankfully, that doesn't happen very often. Uh, you know, I'm not at risk of losing my license. But um, the, the kids need to see that as adults, and I'm happy to give that, um, as well as uh, you know, making mistakes in in learning when when I've wanted to learn something. So there's another example of where you. Um, try and let go um you know I, I haven't got all the answers pookie um teachers um uh too often i think this is a bit of a cultural thing as well um you know perfection is is, is all that's acceptable it has to be you know perfection and we're human beings pookie and uh you know all right is okay good you know is okay perfection can just mess with you and uh yeah um so uh, a conversation around mistakes, uh, letting go of my own perfectionism. I want to get things right, but letting go of that and um, creating a space where the kids can forgive themselves and learn from the mistakes and then hopefully move forward. How did you end up uh, doing this kind of work? So I know you you mentioned very briefly uh, that you so you you finished school at 16 and didn't become a teacher till quite a bit later. And um, I feel like there's probably quite a lot of story to be told there. Um, <laughs> what what what? It, yeah, I'll just leave that there for you to decide how many blanks you'd like to fill. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, the, the, it is only a, a one hour uh, podcast, but um, I think uh, I've, I've done a lot of different jobs, um, so uh, I can talk to the 
uh, kids about um, about different jobs and you know they what you actually get from the jobs that actually look look quite glamorous or look like they might be the stereotypical job that you should do um, but I also can talk to kids about you know the value of education and um, to, to cut a very long story short and 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 uh, perhaps as a bit of a tagline um, a, a wonderful head teacher um, that, that I, I was on a leadership team with um, uh, some time ago now but I still keep in touch with him he used to talk about um, used to talk about two things generosity of spirit and um, he always wanted to know what what teachers were doing to demonstrate generosity of spirit and but the other thing was that the power of education to change lives and the power of education to change lives and I think you know we as teachers the, the, this job is so demanding um, the, the job asks a lot of us uh, however you work in education and um, but um, I, I talk to teachers about meaning and purpose and to, to know that you know on any given day you could have the conversation or you could deliver the lesson or you could um, intervene uh, with a kid um, that puts them on a completely different trajectory completely different uh, pathway and and that's the power we have as teachers and that's the power education has you know I um, Pookie I, I spoke to a, um, a young graduate who I didn't teach but I was in the department and at the school and she said that um, she, uh, she, she she'd reached out to me because she wanted to apply for um, uh, a teacher training course and uh, in this conversation I said well what, what she said I decided to be a teacher after 30 minutes of Miss Hughes's lesson in wow. year nine I wanted to be and like you know it just sends a shiver doesn't it and that's um that's a, a graduate uh, with a first and an MA uh, from Durham and UCL you know I mean she's no fool uh, she's not uh, doesn't have to say anything but she said that I want to I want to be I said I just said make sure you say that in your interview wow. make sure you say that in your interview because that's but that's the power we have as teachers you know you 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 put it out there you you um and it, it boils down to you know how you teach what you teach how you talk to kids and uh, I just believe that um you know there's there's kids out there that need that second chance um pretty much like I did when I was 16 18 25 30 <laughs> so it's, it's it's really powerful thinking about that yeah the the role that you can play and I don't think you necessarily probably even always know do you the impact that you that you have you, hearing that that story of that young lady who went on to teach it just it makes me think of my own schooling and um I, a very close friend of mine now uh, was my teacher when I was at school so he's uh, Colin Gambles he's the head teacher at Hutchison's posh school up in Glasgow and wow. he was my psychology teacher when mm -hmm. I was doing A levels and I always say to him you know if he'd have been my maths teacher I would have gone into maths but he was my psychology mm -hmm. teacher so here I am and mm -hmm. it, I don't yeah and, I, and quite quite what it was that you know I don't know we all, we all have different people that we connect with don't we but um I think it's well, it's amazing when you have that yeah yeah that, that. and I mean you've did you reach out to him to tell him that or did you come across him professionally or have you kept in touch he so he, I, t I have told him but no the reason we got back in touch actually was because a few years ago he was looking for someone to do some uh, in-service training and one of his colleagues recommended me um, and it's one of those names to be honest he was like ah oh. so we reconnected well, then and yeah. and actually I was very I've never been um, more nervous about doing anything than I was about teaching his staff because he was the best teacher you could ever imagine just such an inspiring teacher so the idea well, of then teaching his staff was terrifying <laughs> yeah well um I, I train NQTs and, and young teachers and um I say to them that it, it, it is a tough job mm -hmm. um but we can uh, we can do hard things with teachers you know I, I give them that little mantra we can do hard things but I also say there's an there's an incredible prize lying at the heart of teacher waiting for them in 5 10 15 years time when a kid comes up to them uh, a grown adult and tells them that they are doing what they're doing now because of them as a teacher yeah. because of the, the way they were because of the lessons they taught and I, I i say i'm pretty 
securing this, that that would happen at least three times, maybe five times in, in a 20 year career. I've had it happen over five times. I've had emails, I've had teach, I've had, um, I've had you know, emails out the blue. I've bumped into to kids and that, that, you know, I mean, what an amazing thing to, you know, when you think about, you know, what gets you going in the morning, especially at this time, you know, we're in, you know, dark, dark days for teachers, you know, we're all under incredible strain and, and pressure, but to know that we can still go out there and make that difference is, uh, it, I find that really empowering. And when people say, well, you know, how can you do that? You know, it's, you know, how, how can you go back and work with her? And she said that, and it's about, you just wait for that moment when you make that connection when you say that one thing that, that makes them think differently about education and ultimately about themselves and, and reconnect with themselves and hopefully start to realise some of that potential. That was one of the really interesting things when I got to know Colin again. I always want to call him Mr Gambles. <laughs> yeah, of course. I'm sure you do, Puka, yeah. yeah. When, when, I, when I kind of got to know him again, one of the really interesting things about it, so, yeah, in a very brief nutshell, the, the thing that was, was special uh, to me about him was that where everybody else saw my problems and there were a lot of problems I was at that time like anorexic self-harming suicidal things weren't great but um and so I was given a lot of leeway but never by him he always just thought I was a you know bright kid that that could do well if I just tried hard kind of you know that that kind of that kind of uh, vein but um the really interesting thing for me was when I spoke to him about my childhood self how different my perceptions of me at school and his uh I found that yeah maybe maybe there's a podcast in that maybe I should get him on sometime and uh oh you yeah <laughs> you absolutely should uh I mean that's an absolute gold mine isn't it and um but it is I, I do recognize that it is strange um uh even now as a as a teacher professional as, you know, certainly uh, i think back to the heads that i worked with and it, it's hard you know but it, to actually call them by their first name um but that's the you know the the authority yeah. that we have as teachers and um you know you, you've got to wield that very carefully because yeah, uh, you do have it and obviously you know sadly the reverse applies and if you um say things to young people um, I did some uh, some interviews, Pookie. I mean, um, if, I don't know if you've got time to just mention. I did some interviews um, on behalf of um, a colleague that was kind of wanted to know a bit more you know, the voices of the dispossessed, the voices of the disengaged. And I did some interviews with the uh, young people I was working with. And, you know, um, yeah, OK, you can say, well, take it with a pinch of salt or they would say that. But I didn't I didn't prompt them. Um, I asked them very open questions and they all recounted, you know, those teachers that humiliated them, that, that shouted at them, uh, that backed them in a corner. One or two even spoke about, you know, physical interventions um, that led them to um, uh, disengage and disconnect from school. So the reverse applies. And, you know, uh, we have to be careful that what we say and do um can can finish kids off and um uh, push kids away from education um so yeah i mean yeah and of course it, with, with disconnected kids i mean there's so much we could talk about about their unmet needs you know uh i couldn't write i did you know i i found it difficult picking up a pen i remember uh, one student just heartbreaking and then being made to write and he couldn't and um uh, another lad um so often Pookie, you know death you know grieving you know on on um family members lost and ungrieved for i come across that so often you know and yeah. the young people haven't and i know that this is a problem you you know as well that uh, and this manifests obviously as um uh behavior uh, you know a, a, and a call for help in schools and it's not or it's not sometimes it's not met so uh yeah um I was just going to say, just to, uh, as we come to the end, that um, a lot of people say about, um, you know, holding young people to account. Um, you know, that I've, I've talked about making it exciting, making it interesting, holding a, a wide space, you know, letting the mistakes go. But um, I talk about responsibility a lot. Um, I, I use three words all the time. I've talked a lot about potential and, and how I start those conversations. I talk a lot about um, relationships obviously um but i also talk about responsibility and those challenging conversations when 
um, you know, the, 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 the young person um, has to own uh, what it is that they've said or done. Um, but what I point out is that if you've got the relationship with a young person, if they trust you, they will have that responsibility conversation about why something's got wrong, why they've forgotten something, why they keep on doing something. Uh, even out of a, a difficult situation, you can find a teachable moment talking about responsibility if the relationship exists that allows that to happen. Um, but um, sometimes um, my work gets painted as if there's, um, you know, it's just free and easy, you know, no rules, you know, come as you are, uh, let's see where we stand. But I do have those difficult conversations as well uh, about responsibility. Because presumably you've got some hard work there to do to not only connect with that young person and, and help them to find their way, but also to make them kind of world ready. They need to be able to manage not just with you, but back in school or in work yeah. or. Yeah, the world doesn't care about your problems. <laughs> the world <laughs> doesn't care, sadly. But, I, you know, I don't, you know, I, and you can sound, you know, there's a risk. And I, I say that very tongue in cheek because I absolutely, you know, very careful how I say this. Uh, because the last thing you want to be is like they, they've heard everything they've had every threat you know they know that life is hard they've experienced the hard miles um, but you you know I talk about the challenge of life you know as an adult we understand that you know it, it is difficult getting up every day and doing a job and looking after your family and getting your exercise in and cooking a dinner it's it's hard but it, it can be done you know we can do the human the human race has thrived uh, and what I've, what I've got up my sleeve is all those stories of people, young people, in worse situations than the, 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 um, the students I'm working with, in worse situations than them who have overcome adversity, um, who have um, survived and who have thrived. Um, so it's just part of that conversation where, yeah, it is difficult. But the, um, the the challenges of life are are the way, um, as I think of a very famous Roman emperor once said. You know, the obstacle is the way. You know that that life is tough. Um, it's not a bed of roses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, that's not to say I'm empathetic to your struggle. You know, I am. You know, I, I have these scripts that go. I'm empathetic to your struggle, but the struggle is the point. And what are you going to do to get through? To get through that I, I talk to them pookie about my running okay you can't see the full mark goodwin but I, i'm not a, a, a natural born runner um <laughs> but I, I do i run to keep fit um and um you know i don't want to run at 5 30 6 o'clock in the morning you know but i know if i don't do it then i won't do it um the day takes over doesn't it and the day crashes in so you know i talk to them and i say that you know i have ran long distances I, you know I have, I have done races to challenge myself and you know, nobody wants to run 13 miles nobody wants to run 26 miles you know it, it, idiotic behavior but it's a challenge <laughs> isn't it and you know what do you do in the face of that challenge and um it, it, it opens up those sort of conversations uh, um which you know kids need to hear yeah uh, life is very hard and it's uh, sadly it's it's doubly so at the moment what thought would you like to leave people with as we draw to a close? Um, I, I think um, th there's two things that I've um, uh, 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 have um, sustained me um, over these periods of lockdown, and and, and the, the, these it's just one day at a time. Uh, in my work, particularly, you know, it, it's one day at a time. Good days and bad days, and. Um, you know, you hold on to the good days, but you you have to let the bad days go and start afresh. Um, but but one day at a time, small steps, small steps. Um, I suppose I've I've got a bit more time than school has with with some students. You know, everything's 110 miles an hour in school, and things have to be done yesterday. And we've got to turn it around, and we've got to get this kid back into class. Um, I've got a bit more leeway in that respect, but you know find the time to let those small steps be taken and, and, and consolidate. But what one day at a time, I, I set myself up and my kids set the family up uh, for tomorrow. Okay, are we okay for tomorrow? Yeah, we're okay for tomorrow. 
um, you know, you've obviously got an eye on the bigger picture, but 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 um, just concentrate on that one day at a time. And um, we can do hard things. You know, this is hard, but if you focus too much on how hard it is, it can be it can overwhelm. And um, I've got written uh, above my desk. Um, we can do hard things. Uh, um, yes, life's hard, but um, we can do hard things. And it's, you have to remind yourself um, that uh, we will come out of this on the other side. Um, we know what we need to do. We need to keep connected. We need to notice. Uh, we need to look after ourselves. Um, and uh, and we can do that. Uh, we're teachers, Pookie. We're educators. We, we can do it. Mm -hmm.